Well, it's in one way fitting this morning that we're looking at the passage we are in light of some things that Elizabeth and I have gone through over this last while. It's hard on one level to think it's only two weeks. It seems like all kinds have happened in times like that. But when you have an accident to your eye like Elizabeth has had, it is interesting how many things happen along the way. You not only have the immediate and the intense pain that she had and all of the things related to surgery, but Everyday life is different in significant ways. All of a sudden you're dealing with one eye and you're not sure whether you can trust what you're seeing and your brain is having some interesting things. It was fascinating the first couple of days because she would start brushing things aside and she knew her mind was playing tricks on her but there was an ostrich beside her that she kept <laughs> waving away at different times and, uh, and she had some fascinating experiences along the way but now the challenge is that uh, she has some shadows in that eye that she can see and not much more than that, but she doesn't trust what she can see because your depth perception is off and it's easy to trip or it's easy to, uh, to just mismaneuver in different ways or to do something that is more uh, harmful. And uh, she's more tired than she normally is because her eye is compensating for these other parts. And you, you know what it's like some of us much more than others because something's happened and all of a sudden, because one part of your body is affected, it isn't just your body and it's the lives of other people who are affected by the fact that there's a part of you that's not functioning the way it should. As we get older, uh, there's things that don't seem to work the way they used to work. And uh, what does work hurts. And, uh, <laughs> but even when we're younger, we uh, stub our toe. We hadn't been thinking of our toe all day. Now we can't think of anything else for a while. And th that's just the way the Lord has organized the body, that the various parts need each other to function in the way they should. And when they're not functioning in the way they should, it's the whole body that in some way is handicapped by that. That's why in one sense, the Lord designed the body to be a living symbol of what is true of a local church. And so the New Testament uses the symbolism of a body to talk about the fact that just like a physical body has all kinds of parts to it, so a community of believers that God calls together as a church family has all kinds of parts. And the only way the body can function is as each member within the body functions in a significant and in an appropriate way. Because we're not just an independent group of world. A local church is not just a congregation, a crowd that comes to hear a group of people. The Bible speaks about as a, to, to hear somebody speak. It's a, a family in which we are inter, interconnected. It isn't an institution where we just happen to share the same program. It's an organism in which we are interconnected together. And Elizabeth and I and, and the kids have experienced that as so many of you have showed care and kindness to us over this last while and seen our need and brought your love and your care and your food, uh, all of expressing a way of ministering to our need. And that's the way a body should be. And it's really what Peter wants to talk about as he is moving toward the end of his book. He's been talking about how Christians live in the world, in a world that is often hostile, in a world that is often challenging. And he's talked about where Christians live, they may often be in a position of suffering unjustly. And yet we are to live our lives doing what is good and being willing to suffer unjustly out there as aliens and strangers. With the, with the trust in God that they may see our good works as we trust God and glorify God in the day he comes and visits as his convicting power brings people to face the truth of the gospel. But as he comes to the end of the section where he's talked about how we relate to out there, he spends talking about how we are to relate to one another in here, in the family, in the body, as a group of believers. And so last week we began and we're taking two Sundays on chapter 4, verses 7 to 11, a very short section. And this morning I want to focus on verses 10 to 11. But if you have your Bibles, we're going to read verses 7 to 11 and remind ourselves a little bit of what he has been talking about. So 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 7. The end of all things is at hand. 
Therefore, be self-controlled and sober-minded. Be, as we said last week, be clear-headed and have a calm heart for the sake of prayer. Above all, keep loving one another earnestly, fervently, because love covers a multitude of sins. Show hospitality to one another without grumbling. As each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied, or I love the, this word, it is a word I think this catches our idea more when we say God's many colored grace. Whoever speaks, as one who, let it be as one who speaks oracles of God. Whoever serves, let it be as one who serves by the strength that God supplies, in order that in everything God may be glorified through Christ Jesus Christ, to whom belong glory and power, might, dominion, forever and ever. Amen. Now, Peter, as we noticed last week, begins by reminding us that we live on the edge of eternity. The end is imminent. It's near. The Lord could come at any time. Therefore, he says, first of all, in your relationship to God, be clear-headed and calm-hearted. Trust in a sovereign God. Trust in an uncreated creator, as we sang, who uh, is in control and come to him in dependence and prayer. And then he talks horizontally about our relationship to one another. And as he talks horizontally, he says that we are to be passionate in our love for one another. And that means looking at people who often offend us and do something wrong and cover those weaknesses with love rather than wanting to expose them. Now, there's times when sin needs to be confronted and dealt with, but there's many times where we need to realize, I am going to give them the benefit of the doubt and pray for their maturity in Christ. And not just love in theoretical ways. Open your homes, open your hearts to others and do it to build fellowship and to build family. And now he moves to the third thing he wants to talk about. And they're all expressions, really, of love. Above all, love. Show hospitality. Serve one another. As each has received a gift, use it in serving one another. So what he begins by saying, and let me just notice this first of all, as he begins by saying, as believers in Christ, as God's people, we have received gifts. And specifically, he's thinking here about one kind of gift. Now, that statement about gift embodies everything that God has done for us in Christ. So we think, first of all, that the gift of gifts is the gift of our Lord Jesus. As Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 15, thanks be, chapter 9, verse 15, thanks be to God for his unspeakable, his indescribable gift and then we think of the most familiar verse, for God so loved the world that he gave. So we have the gift of the Lord Jesus. And related to the gift of the Lord Jesus, we have the gift of the Holy Spirit. So Peter writes that repent and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So the moment we trust Christ, God's Spirit comes to live within us. And we are indwelt, sealed, baptized, with the Spirit of God, who lives within us. Jesus says, if anyone is thirsty, let him come unto me and drink. And he who believes in me, out of his innermost being shall flow rivers of living water. And then John says, this he spoke of the Holy Spirit, which those who believed on him would receive. The Spirit was not yet given because Jesus was not yet glorified. But on the day of Pentecost, he went into heaven. And since then, Every believer, the moment they truly trust in Christ, receives the gift of the Spirit of God. And of course, we think immediately of the gift of salvation, the gift of eternal life. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. By grace you're saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. All of those things are gifts. But what Peter has in view here is a particular kind of gift a gift 
that is an enablement for service. We often use the term spiritual gifts. A spiritual gift is, we could use the same term, a ministry gift. Simply speaking, when we're talking about this, and there's four major passages in the New Testament that speak about it. First, Romans chapter 12, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, uh, Ephesians chapter 4, and 1 Peter chapter 4. So I always remember it, two twelves, two fours, and then remember it on that basis. And it's given different terms in each of those in each of those passages. But what he's talking about is a God-given enablement for serving others. A way in which God the Holy Spirit, these are called spiritual gifts because they come through the Holy Spirit living within us that enables us to serve in the body of Christ. Now, they're different from a natural gift. And what I mean is we receive natural gifts and abilities as part of our creation. They're grounded in our DNA. Some of them come from our training and background and experience. A spiritual gift often operates, and we'll talk about this more later, through natural talents and abilities that we have. But they are distinct from them. So let me just notice six things with you about spiritual gifts that help me think my way into this and through this. First of all, spiritual gifts are universally given. Every single believer has at least one spiritual gift. And God in his grace often gives a kind of cluster of spiritual gifts. But every believer without exception has a spiritual gift. That is true of you. A divine enablement for service for serving in the body of Christ. Secondly, gifts are graciously given. So they're universally given, every believer, and they're given graciously. You'll notice in this passage, Paul says that we are good stewards of God's many-colored grace, but they're grace gifts. Now, why do I emphasize that? Because they aren't about your merit. They aren't about your worth. It's not something you earn. It's not something that makes you better or different than another person. They are gifts of God's grace. So no one can take credit for the gift they have. No one can say, look at me, look what I have. They are attributes of God's grace toward you. Thirdly, and this is closely connected, they are sovereignly given. We don't choose the gift, God gives the gift. They are distributed as he pleases, as Paul will say in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. So the gifts are sovereignly given. We're not told to ask for the gifts. The local church is to desire the better gifts and its use and not to get focused on things that are of secondary importance. But God sovereignly gives the gift. So I have no part in one sense in the choice of my gift but I have a whole lot of responsibility for the exercise of my gift. So gifts are universally given. They are graciously given. They're sovereignly given. They are diversely given. So I want to come back to that picture earlier of uh, God's many colored grace. God isn't struck on monochrome. God has huge diversity and so the gift is given, but even though the same gift is given, it is given in a way that appears differently. One of the easiest ones to, for me to think about, for example, is the gift of teaching. The spiritual gift of teaching. I've met some people who have an ability to teach, and they are excellent teachers in a secular area, but somehow when it gets to the spiritual realm, well, they may think they have a gift of teaching, it's just nobody has the gift of listening. And so... <laughs> Nothing happens. But some people have a spiritual gift of teaching, and they have a natural ability in terms of speaking. And so God may give them a gift, in which, a ministry in which they are used to speak in larger contexts, such as perhaps this this morning. And the natural talent and the spiritual gift of teaching comes out in that particular way. But others have the gift of teaching by writing. 
I don't know whether you've ever heard somebody who's written a book that you think is the greatest book you've ever read and heard them get up and speak, and you have trouble keeping awake through it. I remember someone who used to come to our church when I was a, a young man in the university, and he was world-renowned for the books. He's one of the world's great New Testament scholars. And staying awake through his talk was extremely challenging. He had the gift of teaching, but it went with the natural talent of writing and researching and doing those other things. Other people have a natural gift. They don't speak well to a large group, but you put them into a small group and you put them one-on-one, -on -one and they are dynamite in terms of how that... Did you see what I'm trying to say? And that's true with all kinds of other gifts in terms of how they work. They work diversely because God gives them in the uniqueness of his plan and his purpose in the way in which... He works in our lives. Fifth, gifts are given purposefully. Purposefully. Now we're going to come back to this again because it's very important. But in chapter 12, verse 7 of 1 Corinthians, Paul says gifts are given for the common good. And certain gifts are of more value because they build up the church more than other gifts do, he says in chapter 14. Here he says... Use your gift in serving one another. The purpose of gifts is not to give you self-worth. The purpose of gifts is not to give you status. The purpose of gifts is to serve others and minister to others. And God has given those gifts so that we can see the family built up and serving others for his glory and his purpose. Spiritual gifts and in, in all kinds of circles today, spiritual gifts are sought after because they give a spiritual high, as it's defined by that particular group. But that's not why God gives gifts. He gives gifts so that the church can be built up through you. They aren't for you to build you up. They are for the church to build the people of God up. Sixth thing in this list, what have we said? It's universal it is gracious, it is sovereign, it is diverse, it is purposeful. Sixth, it is given accountably. The word I'm after here, if you look back at 1 Peter chapter 4, it says you are to use your gifts as a good steward, as good stewards of God's many colored gifts. The word stewards is somebody who has a responsibility. They have been given something in trust, not to use as they please, but as the owner or manager of that gives. So if God gives me a gift, it, it isn't mine to use as I choose, or even the church's use. It's I'm accountable to God. And when I stand before God, he's going to ask me, what did you do with this? ministry gift, the spiritual gift that I gave you for the purpose of the body. And I am going to be accountable to him. I long to hear him say, well done, good and faithful servant. You did what I called you to do for my glory. Now, having said that, let's back away from the passage a little bit. We've talked about what he means when he says, as each one has received a gift. I want to just back away and notice that we are servants of God and we're called to serve. So you'll notice how Peter's emphasizing the word. As each one has received a gift, use it in serving one another. It's important that we understand what he's talking about here in the context of when it was given. The word serving was a bad word in the Greek world. In the Greek world, in the Roman world, to serve another was to have a position of inferiority. It was degrading to be a servant. It was exalted to be served. And so the idea is that if you were involved in serving, you were a second class or third class person, never mind anything else. And, and that way of thinking is very much the way in which the world thinks. And so people of importance are people who have people serve them and, uh, and dispose themselves to them. And on one occasion, you remember the story, it's one of the most significant in the Gospels. The mother of James and John came to say, Lord, 
When you're in your kingdom, let one son sit on one side and one sit on the other. And they have a little discussion about that back and forth, and the other disciples hear it, and they come furious. Not because they asked the question, but because the mother asked first, because they wanted to be on the right hand and the left in the kingdom of God. And Jesus looks back at them and says, among the Gentiles, those who are in power lord it over them. And those who are first make others their slave. It is not to be so among you. The one who is greatest in the kingdom is the one who is servant of all. And the first among you shall be as your slave. Even as the Son of Man did not come to be served but to serve. And to give his life a ransom in the place of many. So he is saying, my kingdom's upside down. My kingdom greatness is not measured on how many people serve you. My kingdom is not measured on the basis that people trumpet, hail to the chief as you come into the room. My, my kingdom is not hailed, and I can remember in one particular context I was in, when I was one, a speaker in a particular place, we walked into the auditorium after everyone was seated and everyone stood because the preachers were coming. Now, I understand in that context there was another cultural reason for it, and I'm not criticizing for them for that. But even in our own churches, we have, as probably never before in the history of evangelicalism, a culture of celebrityism. That if certain hot preachers, some of them are wonderful men of God, and they're not the ones promoting it. But it's easy to make celebrities of people who are called to be servants. And no one modeled that more than the Lord Jesus. Even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. And you can remember how wrong Peter thought that all was. I mean, Peter's speaking this out of experience. He's in the upper room. He's at the Passover table. He didn't get the seat next to Jesus, like he might have wanted, he's on the other side. John's on one side, and apparently Judas is on the other. He's across the room. And then all of a sudden, Jesus gets up and puts on a towel and starts washing their feet. And what did Peter say? You're never going to wash my feet. It's wrong for you to serve me. Jesus says, if I don't wash your feet, you have no fellowship with me. I love Peter. He says, well, then dump the bucket on my head. <laughs> not, not my feet only, but my whole body. And Jesus sits down after this and he turns to them and says, do you understand what I've done to you? If I, your teacher and Lord, wash your feet, you ought to wash one another's feet. I love the way he shifted them up. Because the normal way of saying it is, if I wash your feet, you ought to wash my feet. I mean, that's the way the logic goes. But he says, no, no. You ought to wash one another's feet. Now, I don't think he's calling here for a ritualized experience of foot washing as part of a church service. I've been part of those, and I've noticed every time we, people do those, they're very careful to wash their feet beforehand and put on clean socks and have everything in totally appropriate order. It's easy to wash people's feet in that way. What he's calling us to is a life of serving one another and ministering to one another and caring for one another. So gifts are to be used so that we can minister and serve in different places within the body. Now notice in verse 11, or the end of verse 10, middle of verse 10, and then the beginning verse 11, he talks generally, very generally, about spiritual gifts. Now, if you take all the lists in the New Testament, you can come up with 19 or 20 different things that are said to be spiritual gifts. And I'm not going to take the time to go into that. Peter's concerned about two here. And we can have other discussions related to, are, there, are all the spiritual gifts that were present in the early church present today? Again, that's a ver valid and worthy discussion. It's not where we're going to go this morning. But he talks about two basic categories. He talks about speaking gifts and serving gifts. And I think when he's talking about speaking gifts, he's talking about things such as teaching, talking about evangelism, 
talking about what he talks about in other places, the gift of wisdom, the gift of knowledge, prophecy, the kind of gifts that use the tongue and speak outwardly. But he says, if that's the kind of gift you have, if you have a verbal gift, if, you, if you're going to speak, make sure you are speaking the oracles of God. In other words, the burden if you are given a spiritual gift is not to give people the benefit of your opinions or the benefit of your prejudices, but the word of God. And you are bound as a servant to use your gift under the authority of the Lord Jesus. And the only way you do that is to make sure you're communicating what God says, not what you think. And if you are going to say what you think, label it as this isn't worth anything other than my opinion. But when you're speaking and you're giving God's word, give it as an oracle of God. Thus says the Lord. Or as Billy Graham said so often, the Bible says, because it doesn't matter what Billy Graham said, what it does matter is what God says. So the gifts that involve speaking are tethered to scripture in a way that is absolutely clear. And then he says, if you have a serving gift, and you can think of all the serving gifts that are given, they're talked about things like helps and administration and leading and giving and faith in terms of trusting God for vision and direction and these other things that are said to be gifts that feed and use the body. And by the way, it's really important that we don't think that sec serving gifts are secondary gifts. They are not secondary in value. Paul says, and he goes on on this in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, that without the internal organs, what good is the mouth? What good is the eye? The, the eye can't say to another part of the body, I have no need of you. And you, and you think about how in many ways, with all respect to Elizabeth and what she's had, and with all respect, I've had lots of eye trouble over the years. Losing an eye is not nearly as significant for the body as having really serious internal organs that threaten your life in another way. And what he's saying in a special way there is, you know, if I can use this uncolloquial or this very colloquial way of putting it, the guts of the church are not the people who are up front. They're often people who are just serving, who are ministering the grace of God and carrying the sweet aroma of Christ in their ministry in so many different places. But he says, do it. Do it in the strength that God supplies. Now, that's his call to us, to recognize that God has in some way gifted us so let me just put it together. In the larger context, what he is telling us is the purpose of all this is to bring glory to God. There's a common purpose that we all have to serve one another and to serve the body of Christ in a way that glorifies Christ. It's interesting and it's paralleled. All of this comes from what is primary. Remember verse 8? Above all, first place, love one another strenuously. And it's interesting in 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians, Paul talks about the gifts that the Corinthians were enamored with. But he interrupts his discussion. And he pauses. And what comes between chapter 12 and chapter 14? Obviously chapter 13. But what's chapter 13 all about? It's all about the greatest of these is love. So it's not the giftedness that matters nearly so much as the love that matters. But when love matters, giftedness becomes an expression of love. And so we're to understand the gifts that are given in that way. Now let me just say something connected to that. Gifts are discovered by serving. Gifts are discovered by serving. And there's things that we are all to do in the body. We're all to serve. We are all to help. Giftedness may define my major area. But for example, there's a gift of giving. We're all to give. 
There's a gift of teaching. In some area of our life, every one of us is called to teach. We're, there's a gift of evangelism, but we're all to share the gospel. And I've seen some people look at different things that need to be done in a local church, and sometimes those needs are urgent, and they say, oh, that's not my gift. If it needs to be done, it's your responsibility. And I need to do what I can to solve that, whether it's my gift or not. I shouldn't speak this way, but I, I can remember over the years as I've served with other pastors who've been on staff, there were a number who would you see, and there was a need, they were jumping right in, they were filling it. But there was others who say, that's not on my job description. Did you see the story in the paper the other day about somebody who was a lifeguard and there was a boy drowning in front of him and some kids went out and they brought him in and saved him. But when he was asked why he hadn't done it, he said, I wasn't on the clock. Can you imagine a lifeguard who sees somebody drowning and says, I don't punch in for another 10 minutes. Well, we can see needs in the body and think, well, let somebody else do that. But the call is to do it. And we discover our gifts not by taking a spiritual gift survey, which may have some value, not by filling out a little form, but by serving and seeing where God begins to use us in the body of Christ. If I can use myself as an example, and I'm not in any way saying I'm a good example, but I'm in, in this way. I, when I was a high school student, I had a passion for serving Christ. And I was very involved in my high school ministry uh, and, and jumped in. And we began to start this, what was called Interschool Christian Fellowship Club, and get it going in different ways. And then as we got it going, somebody said, well, Gary, why don't you lead a study in this particular, in this particular thing? And then as time went on, I noticed that I kept getting asked to lead and to teach in different ways. And I was willing to do whatever. And as time went on, I just seemed to be asked to lead and to teach. I wasn't pushing myself forward, but other people were sensing that I was gifted. I really wanted to be able to preach the gospel. I really wanted to be an evangelist. That was, and I had a friend who was a, a gifted friend, and uh, he had the gift of evangelism, and I used to get annoyed. He'd go out, and he wasn't that great a preacher, but God had gifted him, and he would speak, and people would come to Christ afterwards. I would speak, and people would come up afterwards, and they would say, that really helped me. I understood that in a way I didn't understand it before, and I was annoyed. I wanted what he had, and it took me a while to accept, no, God hasn't called me to be Terry. He's called me to be Gary. A bad second choice, but nevertheless, that was the choice he laid upon me at that particular time. And the way in which we discover our giftedness is that other people begin to affirm us, and they begin to say, God used you in doing that. The reality is, it's easy to come and even be here and to look around and think, I wonder what role I could play. And not every way of using your gift is ever going to appear on an organizational chart of a church. It's going to become when you see a need and you sense, I, I can do that. I can fill that. And God will begin to use that in different ways to direct your life and ministry into the body of Christ and to see that I'm part of this family and God wants me to use that gift for his glory and for the good of the people around me. His name, And some of them will take us outside of the boundaries of the local church and will become the church's agent in different ministries outside who are showing the ministry of mercy and the ministry of compassion into some of the areas of need and enable us to extend our boundaries and to be what God enables us to be in this community. But all of it comes to the last half of chapter, verse 11, I'm sorry. All of this as speaking gifts are employed, as serving gifts are employed, as he puts it, that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. The chief end of man, as the Westminster Catechism says it well, is to glorify God and or by enjoying him forever. Whatever you do in word or deed, do all to the glory of God. Paul writes, here's our purpose statement as Redeemer Fellowship. The purpose of Redeemer Fellowship shall be to glorify God. That's our prime calling. 
that's our prime concern. It isn't measured in numbers, it's mentioned in glorifying God. The purpose of Redeemer Fellowship shall be to glorify God by seeking to carry out His purposes in the world. This involves making more and better Christ followers who celebrate our Lord Jesus Christ in corporate worship, love one another, seek to obey Him in every area of life, and share and show the gospel at home and abroad. But it begins with each of us in the family of Christ being who God has called us to be as we serve one another to serve and glorify our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So Paul wants us to serve. He wants us, as we serve, to know our gifts, to come and understand what they are. If we know what they are, he wants us to embrace our gifts. He wants us, having embraced our gifts, to employ our gifts and to use them for the good of others. And ultimately, to enjoy our gifts. There's no, if only I was in the body of Christ. If only I had that gift. If only I was more than just someone with the gift of fill in the blank. No, no. You, that's who you are to God's glory and by God's grace and be it. Delight in it because you matter to us and you matter to the body of Christ. Because we're not called to be consumers, we're called to be contributors together so that God might be glorified. There's an old story of four brothers who were having a party together. And uh, it was a family gathering and there was quite a few there. And uh, each of the brothers was... Uh, supposed to bring wine for the party. But one brother said, uh, uh, I just financially things are tight, said to himself, I think what I'll do is I'll just bring, get a wine bottle and fill it with water and we'll pour it into a common thing and they won't know that I brought water. So they had the party. And when they dipped into the wine, they found pure water. All of them had thought the same thing. <laughs> God calls us to bring what he has given us and to use it for his glory.